be recording this session so that the meeting can be replayed for the public and any member who's not available to view it. Members are reminded of the recording and may wish to consider switching their own video presentations off. Um, and again, remind you of the use of the hand to tell the chair and myself if there's a need to speak. If we could start the meeting by going through a quick roll call to confirm who is here and who isn't. Councillor Duncan, we've already spoken. Councillor Grugian. Sorry, Ms. Grugian. <laughs> if members could say yes when I call your name, please. Luan. Hi, morning. Luan Grugian here. Hi. Thank you. Councillor Al Samurai. Uh, present. Councillor Bell. Present. Councillor Dunbar. Hello, yes, I'm here. Kim Crutenden. Yes, morning. Morning. Alan Gray, we believe is on holiday. John Tomlinson. I'll come back to John. Sandra McLeod. Yes, I'm here. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Alex Stephen. Yeah, I'm here. Caroline Howarth. Caroline's coming slightly John. late. It's OK, I will right, get that when she comes in. Yes. Little John. Yes, yes. morning, Chris. Mike Adams. Yeah. Jenny Gibb. Yes, I'm here. Jim Curry. Yeah. Graham Simpson. Yes, I'm here. Morning. Maggie Hepburn's given her apologies. Shona McFarlane. Morning. Alison Murray. Howard Gemmel. I'm here. And Angela Scott has indicated she will also be absent from this meeting. That is all your members accounted for, Chair. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, we'll just we'll crack on with the business. I will I will endeavour to take a break at about eleven thirty. I think an hour and a half is a long enough. Um, when we take the break, we'll take ten minutes. Don't log off. Just turn your screens off and go off and do whatever you need to do. And I'll remind you to come back in about ten minutes. If we log off, there can sometimes be difficulties with people getting back into the meeting. All right. Um, so we'll go through the agenda. We're going to have an update from Chris has helpfully of, agreed to give us an update on the COVID situation. Um, we'll take that alongside the Chief Officer's report as item seven. OK. Right. So the first item is any declarations of interest. Does anybody have any declarations to make? I think I should say that you know, item 10 is on expenses for um, service user rep. Not that I have any, but I should mention it. OK, we'll, no we'll note that. Okay. Are you going to participate in the item, though? You're not going to go away? No, I'm not going to go away, okay. unless you'd like me to. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> OK, if you could note that, please, Derek. Anybody else? Yes. Right, OK. The um, next thing is the determination of exempt business. Um, we're going to take items 14 and 15 as exempt business because they're commissioning decisions. Um, right, on to the minutes of the meeting of the 9th of June. I'll take them for accuracy and any matters arising at the same time. So page seven, page eight, Page nine, page ten, page eleven, and page twelve. Okay, and we'll just note that this is the additional meeting that we agreed that we would have following consideration of the medium-term financial strategy last time round. Okay, and the minutes. So I take it that the minutes are agreed and approved. Fine. I don't see any dissent. We're on to item five, which is the notes of the Clinical and Care Governance Committee in on the 2nd of June. Leslie, have you got anything you'd like to update the committee on, and the, the board on, on this? I don't, I don't have anything I want to update. I mean, I'm just going to say that there was, um, you know, this was the Clinical and Care Governance that was called for 
um, you know, out of some concerns around um, governance. There was two substantial um, items <clears throat> really on the agenda. Um, the monitoring report, um, which was very detailed um, and provided some assurance um, in terms of public protection and also a very detailed as part of it DATEX um, report, which the clinical and care group we're going to include, um, sorry, we're going to um, look at in terms of, you know, I think maybe like drilling down further in terms of operational risk. Um, and then there was a very detailed report that had been requested um, about um, support to care homes during COVID, um, which again, I think provided assurance in terms of uh, monitoring, scrutiny, and support arrangements. <clears throat> and Chris Littlejohn also provided quite detailed information around um, control measures and testing for care homes. Um, I suppose what I'm aware of is we've since had another clinical and care governance, but I don't want to do a verbal update on that. I think um, I think it's you know it's only this item that's on the agenda, so that's essentially I think. Um, to say that really a lot of assurance was provided by those two very detailed reports in terms of, I think, um, you know, some of the information that we'd been requesting earlier. So thank you. Thanks, Leslie. This report is just for members to note. So we'll move on and we'll get the minute of the July CCG at the next IJB meeting. Yeah. Now we're on to the business planner, which is item six. Alex, are you going to take us through this? I, 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 can, I can do, Chair, if, 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 that, if that's helpful. I, I think it would be really helpful for us to understand the, cost, the kind of um, collision of business and also to consider whether we need to schedule another additional IJB meeting for October. And this, yeah. this report is the, is the background to that decision. Okay, so I, 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 I guess what, what we're kind of seeing as it sits at the moment is that, you know, we're now into that phase where we're, where we're living with COVID and, and, and trying to move things forward. Um, and, you know, we're, we're gradually bringing, bringing all the governance systems back up again and, and so on. So the, uh, the, the Risk and Audit and Performance Committee is going to come on um, at, at the end of this month and, and, and some of the other, some of the other um, you know, governance things will start to start to come forward as well. So on, on today's agenda, we've got the, 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 the information at uh, for, for today's and, and that should tie back to what's on, on the agenda and uh, we're looking to bring a, a, a potential for a, um, a, the model complaint system in, in, in September and, and we're looking to bring some of the stuff around about the, uh, the learning, um, mental health and learning disability and uh, market facilitation and also the amendment to the IGB standing orders in December. September's meeting um, you know, is is a big one as as, as you've highlighted. Um, we you know we've got the, the information on there at this stage. We're as confident as we can be that we'll be able to 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 bring bring these reports back. Um, but you know, if 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 you were minded to bring a, a another report in, then then we uh, another meeting in, then then we could look to kind of profile some of that that information across these across two meetings and 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 give it uh, more scrutiny and assurance around about that. There's uh in in terms of September, there's a, a record management plan. Uh, that that we are we're, we're looking to bring back as well, uh, and and and, a, and, a, and my understanding is we're looking to bring that back in September to do as, as well. So that's a, a slight omission from here, but that's another another record there. In terms of the uh, one of the reports on today's agenda, the the finance report, I, I've suggested that you you may wish to the committee may wish or the the board may wish to uh, bring back a. Uh, or, or, or have a meeting in October to, to bring some of the some information back. And um, my recommendation would be that if that was in relation to finance, that that happened early uh, in October, 
Uh, I, I, I suspect the 28th is probably too late at that point, but I do I do know that there's a provisional meeting on the 28th of October within there as it sits at the moment. So Chair, I, I'm not going to say any more around about this. I hope that's been helpful in terms of taking you forward and giving you some background on what we're actually doing. And, and I'm happy to take any questions. OK, yes, thanks, Alex. That was helpful. I'll open us up for comments from the board members and questions. Um, let's see, I, I'll, I'll see Jill first, then Luanne, then Leslie, please. Hey, thanks, Chair. Um, I just wondered if I could ask how we are prioritising items going forward to come to agenda meetings. Um, obviously, accepting the reasons why some of the reports have been delayed from, from previous meetings. The other question I wanted to ask, which is kind of hand in hand, is given that there are some quite substantial items that are being suggested to go to the December meeting, I, I was wondering if we would have scope to have an additional meeting because I, I'm not quite sure how good governance and scrutiny is to have papers as a scheme of integration, standing orders, governance alongside with the grampian wide strategy for mental health and learning disabilities but i would welcome some comment on that um i think I come back. Yeah, um, I, I would just say that, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree there's a lot of work and, you know, stuff has been pushed back as it sits at the moment. And, and that's basically been because the officers have been trying to, to deal with that response phase. Um, you know, I, I wasn't at the last pre-agenda meeting, but perhaps we, we could have a look at the groupings of some of this stuff to see if it would, uh, you know, where, where it logically fits, if, if, if that would be helpful. Yeah. OK, thanks. See that sticky mute button there. Um, my, my thinking, I noticed the daycare paper uh, is, is talking about coming back for an update in October, so I'd, I'd, I'd support the idea of having an October meeting if that was going to give us um, better timings for, for discussion of, of you know these these important items, even if it's a shorter meeting, I think to spread it over, uh, to spread these big items over a number of meetings would be helpful. Um, and it also takes on board some of the feedback we've had about how difficult sometimes it can be to focus and, and stay on teams for, for longer than a couple of hours. So my, my view would be to, to have an October meeting if that was, you know, if there was sufficient business to discuss um, whether that's daycare and, and finance and other items. And so, so that's my view on that. And, and the other point I just wanted to make was, are we still, um, we're still waiting for um, a timetable which is going to give us a sort of plan on a page for all the different IGB activities that are coming up over the next few months. So just just wanted to wonder where that was at and if we were going to get sight of that quite soon. Um, yeah, that's including our workshops and the board yeah. development activity as well. Yes, yeah, we do need to get that out to board members. I think after we've made a decision today about an October meeting, then we can, I'll work with, you and I can work with Derek on getting that time, that schedule for IJB for the next six months out to people. Yeah, okay, thanks. Leslie. If I could also remind you, Chair, that Marion has indicated she'll come forward with some dates for you for your development sessions as well, which we're all waiting on to go into that timetable that hopefully we can get out. OK, okay. thank you, Derek. Leslie. Um, hi, um, I'm, I'm quite agreeable to an uh, early October meeting. Um, as well, I think in terms of just maybe the scope of the, you know, um, items that have to be looked at, particularly maybe also finance in the light of maybe not getting our information back to the end of September. So um, that's fine. <clears throat> Excuse me. The question I've got um, is really around, I don't know if it's a question, more a comment about um, there's an, the, the item that's on for the 22nd of February. Um, around lessons learned in terms of the COVID-19 response. Um, 
I just wondered if that could be brought earlier, because it seems to me the 22nd of February is quite late on in the, in the um, kind of scheme of things in terms of getting, you know, the kind of information um, that we might need um, before then. So is there any possibility it could be moved to December? Sandra, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I can certainly come in. Um, I think with regards to the lessons learned, paper, there's numerous papers that have been getting pulled together on this. Um, there's one that will be getting circulated. I think the chief officers and things have actually done that. So um, we, we can certainly bring it forward to December, but I think it would just be whether we would have been through um, a, a full review of everything. So happy to take that if that's what's needed and just be conscious that we may not have the full detail for that time. I think it would be helpful to kind of reflect on what we've learned so far, but bearing in mind that we'll have, we'll definitely have a winter surge, won't we? And we may well, we'll have lessons learned from this current local outbreak um, and we may well then have to plan for just managing with COVID for a longer period. So I, I agree with Leslie. I think it would be helpful to have that in December on the assumption, on the on the basis actually, that it's not going to be the end of COVID. It's just a lessons learned up to a certain point. I think we'd all be happy to take a paper on that basis, particularly if uh, the work is being done at the moment and informing Operation Home First anyway. Um, certainly, we'll certainly see about that. Um, I think what I would say is that there's numerous papers on lessons learned, and it may well just be that um, there's an overarching paper with it. Quite a few appendixes may well be more helpful. Okay. But we'll certainly get that for December. Thank you. That's fine. Um, Leslie and Luan, your hands are still up. Are you both happy? Yeah, OK, thank you. Right, I think I'm hearing loud and clear that we, we do need an extra meeting in October. Um, I know that one of the papers that we've got is asking us to make a report back to the next Council Urgent Business Committee, which is on the 28th of October. So I think we need to meet before then. Um, because we'll need we'll need the information about whether we've had the funding from the Scottish Government, which we'll discuss in item eight. And also we can take some of these items that are being delayed maybe to September. We could maybe accelerate them to October. So if Luanne and I could work with officers to come up with a revised business planner and sensible organisation of business for meetings in September, October and December. Um, and We'll be able to refine it at the September meeting that we're having anyway, if people are not happy with some of the items that we're proposing to take in October or December. So, Derek, um, I know there was a proposal looking at dates for the 28th of October. Can we accelerate that maybe by a week or two weeks? And would that leave officers enough time to get all the preparation work done? Um, part of the challenge around that was over the school holiday periods in October and right. the availability of staff to do that. Hence why we actually, that and the composition of the council diary and meetings was giving some challenging times. The 27th, 28th October were really the only dates that were springing as an urgent availability when you work back to pre-agenda paper preparation and what have you there would have been the potential to allow the request later in Alex's paper for a finance only related matter um, as a quick meeting at some time in the beginning of October, which would have been out with the normal planning cycle and day of the week type thing. Um, I can certainly go and look at them all again, but I do know it will be challenging to get anything earlier than the 27th, 28th October. Okay. OK, so what we're really proposing is an extra an extraordinary meeting to discuss finance earlier in October, if necessary, and then another IJB meeting in October. Is that right? Yes, a, a short finance related matter beginning of October, if that is agreeable when we get to that paper. And yes, a, a fuller business type meeting um, to spread some of the load across, as the suggestion is, 28th October. OK. Um, I accept, I 
I completely understand the scheduling difficulties of a new meeting. So does anybody have any comments on, on that proposal, a finance meeting and then another full IJB meeting? Um, Chair, could I just come in? So the, I think the recommendation in the paper is that we would only hold a finance meeting if there was a, a reason to hold it. So, you know, well, whilst that might just be penciled in there, if, if um, you know, if, if there was no reason to hold it, then we wouldn't. Okay, that's fine. OK, that's fine. That's fine. Right. I think we'll proceed on that basis then. So if we need it, we'll have a finance meeting at the beginning of October. Um, position on that might be clearer at the September IJB, fingers crossed. And then we will schedule another IJB meeting on or around the 28th of October. And Derek will send out diary invites for that. OK. No teacher. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for that. Um, next item is the Chief Officer's report. Um, this is a double hander, I suspect, from Sandra and from Chris. I don't mind who goes first. So um, with regards to the Chief Officer's report, um, Chair, just to say that we had um, agreed at a, or discussed at pre-agenda that given the, the majority of the updates will be through both finance and will be through the Operation Home First for our recovery work, that both of those were all covered. Those are quite substantive papers that are coming forward, so there was no additionality. There's there's nothing else that's not included in those that I felt that I needed to update you with. So I'll just really hand over to Chris, um, that, unless there's any specific questions on that. OK, no, I'm fine with that. Jill, do you want to come in on, at this point? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I wanted to speak about the Chief Officer's report, accepting, of course, that board members have been kept up to date with the ongoing activities of the Chief Officer. I think one of the reasons why I had have previously requested that there is a written report is to allow the openness, scrutiny and transparency for the public on the activities of the Chief Officer even if it was to say what Sandra's just put, put has just said to us, that there are substantial papers and you can maybe send them a link to that. But it is all about what the business of the IGB and what the chief officer is doing for the IGB. And it really is about the public being aware of that. It's fine that we've been kept updated. I don't dispute that point, but it is important that there is a written officer for the public to scrutinise. Okay, well, this meeting's being recorded and will be available for public to hear, and they will hear Sandra's comments just now. And we'll note in the minutes that the Chief Officer referred us to the items later on in the agenda as her substantive report. Um, but we note your comments. All right. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Chris, over to you for the COVID update. Thank you, Chair. Uh, morning, all. Um, very quick summary. Um, and then uh, and then immediate report as to where we're at um, just now. Um, as we went into the weekend, um, Saturday the 1st, Sunday the 2nd of August, as we went into that weekend, uh, we'd become aware that we had a couple of cases, as it turned out by the, by the Saturday, half a dozen cases associated with the Hawthorne Bar um, in Aberdeen. And an incident management team had been set up on Friday the 31st of July in order to manage that uh, that, that known cluster uh, around the bar. By the time that we came out of that weekend, so Monday this time last week, we knew that we were dealing with an increasing number of cases uh, associated with the nighttime economy more generally uh, in Aberdeen City. Um, and as the as the week wore on, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, the number of cases continued to grow. Um, we actually hit the uh, the high the, the peak of uh, of nighttime economy associated cases on the sixth of July, the Wednesday, uh, when we had uh, twenty nine. Uh, sorry, the Thursday, the Thursday, the the sixth of August, when we had twenty nine uh, associated cases uh, in one day. Um, and of course, as you all know, uh, by the Tuesday evening, um, that was a situation that was being assessed uh, through the Scottish Government's resilience room. Uh, and of course, the decision was made uh, uh, jointly 
between Scottish Government, Aberdeen City Council, uh, with input from other partners uh, to, uh, to to put the uh, to create new regulations uh, to put population restrictions back in place temporarily for Aberdeen City. Now, clearly, we've been watching very carefully uh, what has happened um, subsequent to that, um, and the numbers of cases um, have actually declined um, over the course of this weekend. Um, in total, uh, in total, we have had um, since since this all began, and the first case associated with this cluster on uh, Wednesday, the twenty eighth of July. Since then, we have had a total of two hundred and thirty one cases um, of COVID nineteen uh, in in Grampian uh, since that time. The vast majority of those cases have been uh, located in Aberdeen City, um, uh, with some cases uh, uh, in Aberdeen Shire, but the majority of cases in Aberdeen City. And we've got two distinct groups. Um, of the 231 cases, uh, we have 157 cases with a clear association with a pub or a bar in Aberdeen City, which leaves us uh, uh, yesterday, this was the, the information put into the public domain through the incident management team uh, uh, as of half past three yesterday. We had 74 cases um, who were not immediately uh, associated uh, with a, a pub uh, or, or a bar. Um, those numbers will have changed today, so, so today's uh, figures will come out um, at half past three today. And some of those 74 cases uh, some of them uh, will have been spoken to over the past 24 hours and uh, some of them uh, doubtless uh, will be found to have had an association and so the numbers will the numbers will shift. Um, what we're looking at is uh, the, the the Aberdeen city centre uh, pubs and bars associated cluster tends to be a younger demographic so it tends to be people in their 20s and 30s. Um, associated with uh, the nightlife uh, in Aberdeen. Um, and the other cases uh, seem to be older people uh, uh, and uh, generally people in their 50s. Now, there's there's a lot of intensive analysis going on to understand that other group of people. Um, they are largely in the city, some people in the Shire. Um, in terms of what are the connections, if any, uh, between them all and between the younger cohort associated with the pubs and bars. Some will doubtless be household contacts, so some may be um, extended family members, for example, uh, but there's some urgent work going on looking to understand uh, whether or not we have got uh, 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 secondary um, uh, clusters or, or whether this is spread from the from the from the nightlife associated cluster, like I say, that work is 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 going on at pace. Um, associated with those 231 cases in total, all of those 231 cases have uh, had a have been telephoned by Test and Protect, so they've had a contact trace or telephoned them. Um, and as of yesterday, uh, 852 contacts um, had been identified. And so I would just ask members just to consider then that we're talking over 1000 people and each telephone call takes around about 40 minutes um, in total uh, to, to, to do all of the work that's required. Um, so I'll leave you to do the arithmetic in terms of uh, 40,000 minutes, how many hours that is. Let me just uh, all compressed into all compressed into um, uh, largely a, a period of days during last week. Um, but what it, what it will give you a sense of is of a team of people uh, both locally and nationally uh, in the test and protect system working extremely hard, um, very long days um, in order to reach all of the cases and the contacts uh, in a very timely manner. Um, and the vast majority, uh, uh, over 90 percent, were were reached uh, within 48 hours. Um, actually, ma the majority were reached within 24 hours. So really hard work uh, on the part of our contact tracing 
colleagues. Um, in terms of in terms of where we're at just now, um, so the the numbers that, that were coming in um, uh, uh, over the weekend, um, we had uh, we had 28 uh, cases uh, notified on Saturday, of which uh, 19 were known to have an association with uh, a pub or a bar. And on Sunday, we had uh, 21 cases, um, of whom six had uh, a known association with a pub or a bar. Um, although, like I say, the caveat being that amongst the 15, not all of the 15 uh, had been spoken to at that point. So some of those were likely be reclassified as, as having a contact. And then, of course, we'll have the numbers um, from yesterday. But it looks as though uh, since the weekend that we have been on a downward trend uh, in terms of the numbers of cases uh, being reported, detected every day. Um, and I think that probably goes uh, towards the idea that the center of this, the, the, the fuel on the fire, if you like, um, was the, was what was going on um, uh, on the two weekends uh, before Aberdeen City was locked down. And I'm sure most members saw um, pictures trending on social media or uh, in the press or, or, or elsewhere um, in terms of the, 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 the large scenes of crowds um, gathering outside uh, uh, nightlife venues. Um, so the, there definitely seemed to be something um, afoot um, in Aberdeen um, on those weekends, but the numbers do seem to be coming down. I think uh, the, 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 the good news um, is that as so far, um, the IMT was told yesterday that there was there was no sign that anybody had required any hospital attention. Um, so uh, there uh, all a lot of people having a lot of contact with NHS 24 and being given appropriate clinical advice through NHS 24. Um, but pleased to say no sign of anybody needing um, either hospital attention or admission into hospital. Um, as a result uh, of this uh, situation. Um, and I, I, I hear people speaking about uh, us living with COVID. And I dare say then that, that this is what living with COVID looks like. And it just it reminds me of two things then. Um, it, it reminds me of the importance of all of our prevention measures, um, both for us as citizens um, uh, uh, but also in relation to our patients and our clients and also in relation to our workforce and our staff and our colleagues. Um, the, the importance uh, for the IGB in terms of all of our health and social care services and system uh, being supported in relation to safer workplaces, um, that we have the that we have the that we have the key uh, precautions in place around distancing, around uh, the use of PPE where distancing isn't possible, uh, the, the, the variety of hygiene measures, whether that's face masks, whether that's um, uh, regular hand washing, whether that's environmental cleaning, and of course the continued uh, reminder to everybody uh, not to be coming into work or to be coming into clinical areas if people have got any possible symptoms of COVID-19, but instead to self-isolate and to seek a test. And it's a reminder, I suppose, in terms of um, uh, living with COVID, that we will have that we will continue to have something of a bumpy ride. Let me put it that way. In terms of, as well as those preventive measures being in place, that of course we we've, we've got this reactive system in terms of test and protect. So we do everything that we can to prevent the spread of COVID nineteen and additional cases of COVID nineteen um, uh, coming uh, coming into being. But equally, when that does happen, that we've got a a really good system in terms of accessible testing, identifying cases, and a very quick response in terms of helping people to self-isolate and identifying their contacts and having them self-isolate. Now that's where the implications are in terms of the bit of the bumpy ride in that we, what we will see over the next few months is a continuation then of colleagues, the workforce, 
continuing to uh, potentially be um, identified as contacts and needing to uh, stay off work uh, while they're in 14 days isolation. It's, it's, it's the importance of the prevention measures in terms of uh, preventing that happening, but the, but the potential um, for people being asked to self-isolate as contacts, not just our workforce directly, but also um, in relation to the schools. So in terms of clusters happening within the schools, requiring children to stay at home, for example, um, for 14 days, or indeed teachers having to stay at home for 14 days, will of course have impacts on some of our employees' ability uh, to come into work. So I think it's just a, it's a, it's a timely reminder um, as to living with COVID uh, uh, might mean uh, uh, some, some ongoing challenges just in terms of how easily things run. I, I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That was very clear, um, a very clear summary of where we are. So I've got questions from members. So Philip, I see you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, Chris. That was a, um, a very uh, sobering, uh, interesting update on the on the challenges that, uh, that COVID uh, presents, uh, the challenges that are presented with track and trace. And I really wanted just to try and drill a little bit more into the track and trace process. Um, so if I wanted to participate in Aberdeen's night nightlife, um, and uh, I, I would go to the Soul Bar, for instance, uh, along with my footballing mates. Um, what would what would then happen when I got to the when I got to the front door and actually got inside? What what would be the process there? Would I just uh, go and buy a pint, or what would happen? So, so I have I have to admit that I haven't uh, been in a licensed premises um, since any of this happened. My un my understanding is. Um, that we is, is that if we want to go to a licensed premises, most premises, as I understand it, um, require require people to book uh, before they go in, and that people book a table for a set period of time, um, uh, and that uh, and that most premises, as I understand it, are offering table service. So you book to go in, you get a table for a period of time, um, you you have your 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 drinks and uh, and food if that's what you're having um, at your table and then your period of time is up and then you leave. That's my understanding of how most premises uh, are operating. Thank you. So uh, so I wouldn't I wouldn't when I went into the, into uh, any any particular uh, venue uh, need to actually log in with a QR code on my phone or that, that wouldn't happen at all. So I, 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 I'm going to say I don't know, but I don't know about QR codes. What I do know is that premises in Aberdeen were either keeping digital or paper records of people that were attending these venues. Uh, so uh, by having to book in advance, uh, people were either, their details were either captured in advance through a digital system or on arrival, people were, were asked to provide their details um, on paper, so their name, their contact details. Um, I also understand that as a result of uh, events in Aberdeen City, of course, um, that that recording of details is to become mandatory. And, and just to, so one, just one supplemental chair, please. So of those um, 231 cases that, that you, you reported um, and the thousands of phone calls that have been made, how, 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 what was the process to get from, you know, to get from those that were initially tested? Because presumably they, they actually had some symptoms, I would, I would imagine. Um, and, they, uh, and then from that, from there, they said, oh, uh, I went along with my mates. And were they, were they then contacted? I'm just trying to just get a feel for what the process and how it actually works. Yes, no, 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 indeed. Um, I'm happy to set it out. So, so the so so the the default pathway is um, the person goes and gets tested. They have their positive result, and the positive result automatically um, uh, produces their record into the national test and protect system. They get a telephone call from a friendly contact tracer, who 
gives them a, a, a range of advice in terms of what the situation is and uh, where they might get additional advice and assistance. Um, but then the, the key bit being uh, to, to reinforce the need to self-isolate for 10 days from the start of symptoms and then works through a process with them of who their potential contacts are. And that process then is in relation to the case, uh, the 48 hours before the case became symptomatic, everybody uh, that that person uh, was in contact with, um, identifying uh, a, a list then of possible contacts and a, and a conversation in there um, about a, a duration of uh, time spent with the person, distance from the person, um, and so a judgment being made in terms of, excuse me, a judgment being made in terms of whether each of these people are actually a close contact or not. That then finalised list of close contacts, each of those individuals then gets a quick phone call from a contact tracer, um, uh, informing them that they've been identified as a close contact and they are asked to uh, to self-isolate for 14 days. Now, they are not told who the case is um, in terms of how the system is set up, confidentiality is maintained, they're not told who the case is, although it has to be said that actually a lot of the time people already know, their friend has already told them, um, or they've already read it on a social media post um, as to as to who they were, you know, somebody they were out with, so they, they, they realise who the case was. Uh, but nonetheless, um, they are asked to uh, to cooperate uh, and to self-isolate. Now, the, the additional bit to that then, so that's all about preventing the forward spread from the case through their contacts and beyond. So that whole test and protect system is set up to do that. The other bit of the picture, though, is who infected the case in the first case. And that's the bit that our local health protection and contact tracers are also working on in terms of having the conversation with the case about who were they with that m b even before the 48 hours as to who might have infected them. And then trying to cross trace. And of course, in a big, in a, in a, in a large and growing outbreak, of course, the, the linkages then become quite complex. Um, so it takes quite a bit of analytic capacity to, to keep on top of that. What I'm understanding is that actually the test and protect system as it evolves, um, that it, it's actually going to uh, to be able to do all of that in one go. Um, and that, I think, is where the the the, the records within uh, a premises comes in, because then actually having a record of everybody that was in a particular place at the same time as your case. So for the public health authorities to be able to see, well, here's the case. They've told us they were in such and such a place at such and such a time. We can now see who else was in there with them at that time. And then we can make an assessment in relation to where they were sitting, et cetera, by having conversations with them. Where were you in the bar? And we can do that uh, background detective work, if you like, to figure out, A, do we do something individually? Or was there a problem actually within a particular premises where we should be giving a, a general message to uh, to either be alert or a general message to isolate. In other words, it is a, an involved and complex process, which is why uh, it it takes time to do it properly. All right, thank you. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, Chris, for that. I see John and then Kim. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chris. That that was really helpful. And um, my question's at the other end of this process, if you like, because you, you very um, articulately mentioned the the prevention and then the reaction part. And, uh, and I'm quite interested in at that prevention end. Um, if living with COVID means um, occasional lockdowns as with clusters, etc. then Aberdeen City Council presumably has a, a very important role here. So, so I'm just interested in um, their ability to regulate. So I'm kind of suggesting uh, uh, that there may be something unintentional in the time period that people have in, uh, in pubs in that they then book time or just take time at other places and end up 
doing a bit of a pub crawl, if you like, because they can only have limited time in places. So I'm just, I suppose my question is, is, is within that kind of example, um, is it in the gift of the city council to start to regulate that and then, um, you know, win the trust of the public, if you like, in, in the fact that we need to do all those kind of things need to be done so that at the prevention end, we're, 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 we're stopping clusters and, and having to react to them. These, these these kind of incidents, of course, always throw up lots of um, lots of learning, lot and 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 lots of opportunity for learning to think. Okay, so when we restart this, how how might how might how might we do it differently? Um, I I I do think there's a there's a question for us. I think as a country, in terms of why has this happened in Aberdeen, um, and why have we not seen evidence of this um, elsewhere? Is that is it a, is it a matter of time? Um, was it a matter of bad luck for Aberdeen? Um, I dare say um, uh, uh, some of the answers to those questions will become evident uh, over time. Um, so I think in terms of the, I think in terms of the uh, the, the nightlife, um, I, I do think that there's something here in terms of the responsibility for all of us in our different roles. So there's the role of venues um, and license holders in terms of their premises and how the premises are run. Um, uh, and also in relation to their responsibilities in terms of people waiting to get into their venues. Um, there's also the responsibility of all of us as citizens um, in terms of our, our own responsibilities to be uh, following the, uh, the, the, the advice and the guidance um, to stop the spread of the virus. Um, so there, there's that. And then there's also the, uh, uh, I suppose, the pub, for want of a better term, the public order um, issue in terms of uh, managing uh, uh, collections, gatherings of people in public spaces, and how do we best manage that? Um, uh, and, 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 and so clearly uh, uh, there's a role in terms of city wardens, in terms of, in terms of uh, police colleagues, etc. So all of those lessons uh, and, and answers to, to your questions are being raised um, in and through the incident management team. Um, and uh, uh, well, and and are actively being considered. Um, I, I know that they're actively being considered um, by Aberdeen City Council uh, officials and and wider colleagues from other partner organisations. Um, so exactly that question that you're asking: How do we manage this when we restart things in Aberdeen City? Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Kim. Um, yeah, Chris, um, I, I appreciate that um, the guidance that's on the internet and things, I appreciate you didn't write it in the Scottish government, but I think it's just on reflection, um, look at what's happened. I, there was something that came up yesterday around some staff members that I, that I have, and um, it's really confusing and there's far too much to read to be absolutely clear on what you can and can't do. And, you know, things around, you know, having just double checked what I was about to say, you know, you're allowed to meet four households outdoors, three in your own house, but four in a pub, um, potentially another three on top of your own, um, one metre distancing, two metre distancing, masks on entry, um, potentially to places, but not whilst you're seated. And then if you go to the bathroom back and forward, it's total... But to be fair, for, for, for a fairly educated person, it's confusing. And for general masses, um, I can understand. I'm, I'm not, I don't know whether people are, have been directly flouting the guidance, etc. But it's confusing. And I think that's something that very much needs to be addressed if we're actually going to be able to live with COVID going forward, because it needs to be absolutely categorically clear with no exceptions and followed to the letter by establishments and by the general public, by all of us. But it is quite complicated. You know, the safest thing to do is to stay at home, which is what I'm doing. It's quite boring, but um, <laughs> but it but it is um, it's very confusing. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I mean, I, I do feel for our, uh, uh, our, our colleagues in civil service um, uh, uh, and, other, and other colleagues in terms of trying to write guidance to cover all eventualities. Um, there, anybody that's ever had to try to implement guidance will know that, that the, the, the devil's always in the detail and there's always a situation that, that, that just the guidance doesn't quite cover. So I, and I so I do understand um, uh, the, the 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 difficulties in in creating really clear guidance, 
there is there is something about yes we we need all the detail because people ask lots of very detailed questions but i mean fundamentally i know that the um the the use of the recent use of the the, the facts acronym face coverings avoid crowded places etc um i mean and it rep i mean it represents just the fundamentals of this is keep your distance hygiene measures don't go anywhere if you've got symptoms get tested instead i mean there is a there is a simple set of core messages in there um that, that i think you're you're right kim that we should probably be repeatedly articulating what the core simple messages are thank you i don't see any other hands so i'm going to take the opportunity to ask a question myself in the, all the, the analysis that's being done of the cases and their contacts and how it might have spread and actually where patient zero might have been, is there any concern about asymptomatic transmission in Aberdeen? So of, of all those 200-odd um, uh, uh, cases that I mentioned, about two-thirds of those cases are symptomatic. So these are people that have developed symptoms. We know that uh, amid, amidst the, the the great concern in the public last week um, that, that there was uh, an unprecedented demand for testing from people living in Aberdeen last week. Um, and that included a number of people who didn't have any symptoms, but were clearly worried that they might have been exposed. There are uh, technical challenges that I won't go into here in terms of how do you interpret a positive test result in somebody that doesn't have any symptoms. But what we recognised was that was that a third of people who were being tested and amongst those cases that we've spoken about, around a third didn't have any symptoms. So we cannot discount the possibility um, that we may have had some uh, infectious people involved who didn't have any symptoms. And of course, recognising the fact that we do know that people can be infectious up to 48 hours before any symptoms actually develop. So, so we, so in and amongst this, part of this challenge of living with COVID is that we do know that people become infectious before they themselves know uh, through the development of symptoms that they are infected. So, so all of those preventive measures, wearing a mask, keeping your distance, washing your hands, cleaning uh, uh, routinely touched surfaces. Part of that is driven by the fact that we know that people will be out in public spaces without knowing that they're infectious. Yeah, it's just reinforcing the importance of the basic public health advice, isn't it? Um, OK, Luan, I see your hand and Kim, your hand's still up. Are you wanting to come back in? OK. So Luan and then Kim, please. Uh, thanks, and thanks, Chris, for your input. Probably just want to start by putting on record our thanks to the contact tracing team and wider public health for the work that's been happening over the last week or two. It's really, really hugely appreciated by, by us as an IJB. My, my, my question is probably a bit, but it's building on what John was talking about around the nighttime economy. Um, and I suppose where I'm sitting, I, I think our priorities are about getting the schools back, remobilising our health and social care services, getting visits in care homes and hospitals. So is it actively being considered that, I, I suppose I'm questioning, what would be the rush to reopen pubs when these are our other, these are our priorities that, that I've just mentioned? And I'd, I'm struggling to see why pubs would trump those. Sorry for using that word, but um, I just so, so that's my question. Is that actively being discussed as well, Chris? So, uh, so, so I think the fun, the fundamental, uh, the fundamental point that you're the thing that you're pointing out is that to do all of those other things, in order to return to some degree of normal functioning across services across society, it's dependent upon a low level of incidence that in, in order for contact tracing to work, the number of new cases every day needs to be low in order to give the contact tracers the best chance of reaching people quickly, uh, uh, identifying contacts accurately and, and make, just making that system work. So, and then against a background of low level of cases means that any particular setting, the risk of somebody 
unknowingly taking the infection into that setting is uh, accordingly low. So, so the level of community transmission, if you will, is actually the key thing here that allows everything else to happen. Um, so so when, when community transmission was very high and we had a very high level of cases, then the risk was that if you opened anything out of lockdown, then you would have had transmission into a whole variety of settings and we would have just we would have just seeded a whole bunch of separate outbreaks. Once you've got on top of that, which the lockdown helped us to do, you get on top of that, you get the cases right down. You've not quite managed to get rid of all cases. There's still a bit of transmission going on, but the levels are so low that the chances in any setting of of uh, of, of the virus being brought into a setting are accordingly low. Now, having said that, of course, what happened in Aberdeen City is the perfect example. We had 11 days where we had no cases in July in Grampian, the whole of Grampian. And look how quickly um, our cases just escalated. The, 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 the outbreak just, I mean, literally in, in a matter of days, um, a couple of hundred cases out of out of what appear to be nowhere. So, so there's no room for complacency in here, but the low level of community transmission is the key thing. As few cases as possible out there, as low level, because that's what allows um, everything else to happen. Now, the, the key point of this, of course, is that is that it, um, it's all to the good. And I suppose that, I mean the key. I suppose the key thing about hospitality is it's a major employer. It it it, uh, it uh, and and it's all trade offs. So I fully understand this is all trade offs that are required, and none of this none of these trade offs are easy. But I guess we, we need to be mindful of the fact that a lot of people work in cafes, restaurants, bars. Um, it's where their household income comes from. It's what pay it's what pays for their children to be fed. Um, it, so 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 the decision to I, I can absolutely assure all members that the decision to uh, to bring a lockdown in on the hospitality trade in Aberdeen City was it was it was not made lightly or easily at all. And it's this it is this tension between have we have we got a situation here where we're we're, we're we're a situation where spread is being um uh, 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 assisted um as opposed to what are the harms of of closing that down now i've seen the media coverage in terms of exactly that debate uh, being played out in terms of if it came to it pubs or schools which one would you have open I've, and i've seen that and I've seen the I've seen the discussion in and around that. I guess what it I guess what it tells us though, what it tells me certainly, I think what it tells us is that the way in which this is all connected. You might not think that wearing a face mask into into the supermarket has anything to do with the schools, but it does. It's all of those precautionary measures across everywhere that keeps the level of community incidents down, which actually makes it safer for all these other parts of the system to be able to operate in, in something of a, a, a normal way. Now, I think just to answer your question, because I've, I've, I've skirted around it long enough, I, su I suppose I mean, the, the, the observation is, is that other places in Scotland, that their hospitality sectors do seem to be working. And as of yet, we don't seem to have seen an outbreak or a cluster of the scale that we've had in Aberdeen. Again, it comes back to the question of why is that? Have we just been unlucky? Is it just a matter of time? Um, we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, but but the point would be that, that if we are seeing the hospitality trade working elsewhere, um, that suggests that it is possible for it to function and for community transmission to be kept low. Um, so, so I hope that so I hope there's an answer in there somewhere for you, Luan. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Sarah, um, can I come in? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. It, it was just to add a further little comment, Chris, and, and not to continue to have a go about the Scottish Government website, but just as I was listening to to the comments from Leanne, etc. You know, if you put, for example, Aberdeen COVID into Scottish gov Government website, the first thing that comes up is around prostitution, and um, which is interesting. Um, but um, but num it's the tenth thing is the guidance around Aberdeen, and it's in the middle of Nicola Sturgeon's report. So I would say it's not clear for the public where we are and seeing we're back into to, to lockdown what does that actually 
mean and I think everyone is not maybe not everyone um lots of people will be associating well we've closed the pubs we've 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 solved the problem but if you're at Aberdeen Beach on at the weekend in our lovely weather you know social distancing isn't actually doesn't seem to be top on the list of um, people's priorities I, I appreciate it's outside but I think there's still quite a bit of work to be done around messaging um and as I say it's it's not that easy to find directly find I was just a bit surprised as to how many clicks you have to do to to get where we are at the moment just a comment there's a that you're right i mean there's, there's such a huge amount of information um to, to try to find i mean i suppose what i am minded of then is that as health or as a health organization um uh, that that uh, that there is actually a role for us in terms of our continued communications in terms of local population helping people to navigate and find the information um, as easily as, as, as possible. Um, I do think we've got a responsibility um, as, a, as the local health organisation to help people with that. I think it's a very valid point. OK, right. Final comment for this one is Leslie. Um, so. I am having difficulty with my sticky buttons as well. Um, thank you, Chris, um, for your update. It's, um, I think, always assuring to hear um, from you in terms of what's happening. And um, I suppose, I think you've answered quite a, quite a bit in terms of what I, I did have a question around, um, which was really, I think, to do with community transmission and the, it seems to me, the difficulty or challenge around um, how um, you know, the public health people um, managed to locate that. Um, so I'm not going to go over it. But the other part of um, what I wanted to know about was, um, it seems to me that there are some parallels here in terms of, um, you know, the kind of processes that, you, that you're that you using, um, that you've used already, like with care homes in terms of, um, you know, tra community transmission there. And I just wondered about, is there learning in a sense that's come from that experience that you're now using um, in terms of what's happening with pubs and that you may use with schools? Um, uh, yes, no, no, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the fundamentals of uh, uh, communicable disease management, what, what, how, do you, how do you prevent the spread of infectious disease? Um, I mean, the, the, the fundamentals of those are, this, are, are the same regardless of the setting. So, so, so you're quite right to pick up on the fact then that the fundamentals of how infection within the care homes were managed and uh, uh, the preventive measures that were put in place, that the, the fundamentals are there, uh, whether, it's a, whether it's a care home, uh, whether it's a, a, a community, um, uh, for example, the, the nighttime economy setting, or whether it's a school. So the same principles would apply. You're, you're, this, basically what you're asking, you're asking the question for any anybody with the infection, you're thinking to yourself, where have they caught this from? And 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 that that is is there an ongoing risk to anybody from where they caught it from? So you need to think who have they been in contact that might have passed it to them? And are we doing something about that? And you also have to think about and who might they have passed it on to who could then spread it further? So, so the, 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 that's the, the fundamentals of, of this. Um, and so in terms of thinking about, so where did it come from? Where might it be passed on to? What are your control measures then? What are the control measures in terms of managing uh, or reducing the risk of things getting any worse? Um, and, and, that, and that takes us back to um, those basic fundamentals of distancing, hygiene, uh, uh, symptom awareness, for example. So, so the so the so the lessons learned and and the the key ways in which these things are managed will be the same in the school as it was in the care home. You're you're quite right. Okay, thank you. Okay, right. Um, I think I think we've um we've we've had a very full briefing on this. We've um, asked lots of useful questions. I think we've done our job here in terms of scrutiny and governance and oversight, um, but it's nothing compared to the enormous task 
that public health team and the, and the test and protect team are doing. And if we could formally record our appreciation for their work and our acknowledgement of just how what how difficult and what an enormous job it is that they're doing um, to keep us all safe, I think. And if you can pass that back. That abs be absolutely. Okay. I was going to say, I mean, public health in its truest sense in terms of a, a multi-professional, multi-agency response. Um, uh, working with, with, I mean, our key, we always work, I mean, public health and environmental health, hand in glove, always equal partners uh, working in these kind of situations. And I think um, I, I think that this that this particular situation in Aberdeen has really exemplified that in terms of the working between the NHS and Aberdeen City Council and Aberdeenshire Council in terms of uh, environmental health officers and other officers uh, within the local authorities. We, there really has been a sense of um, a single team working uh, working uh, together uh, in relation to the issue. So I will I will certainly be sure to pass on the the thanks um, of, of the board to colleagues. Okay, it's the public sector and public service at its best actually, um, and the partnership working which has been built up over many years. Um, it's, it's all coming good now, hopefully. So we all need to do our bit and be sensible, basically. <laughs> all right, thank you very much, Chris. Jill, I did see your hand going up and down. Do you want to say, come in here before we move on? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, it, it just goes to show what a comprehensive report we got from Chris, because every time I had a question when he was speaking, he answered it. So that's why my <laughs> hand's down again. Thank you. OK, we can add telepathy to his list of skills then, obviously. Right. OK, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Right, we're on to item eight now. I will remember to give us a break at half past 11 in case anybody's getting anxious about that. So 20 minutes to endure before we can take a break. Um, so item eight is a referral from the City Council Urgent Business Committee. Who's going to speak to this report? I think I was going to introduce it, Chair. Um, just a very quick overview to it. That on the 30th of June, the Urgent Business Committee met and one of the papers they considered was the Financial Resilience Recovery Plan. Um, there was recommendations contained within that report as outlined in this report and the committee made a decision following some discussions that they wished to add some further recommendations. There was quite a numerous number of them, one of which referred to in here is item IX number nine was to forward this referral to the board for them to consider further action. Um, I would conclude this bit by reminding the members, as I'm sure you all remember, that the subject of the IGB finances and consideration of referral to the Scottish Government had been subject of much discussion at the meeting before the UBC met. Um, and basically, that's all I have to report, to Chair. OK, thanks very much, Derek. Um, Jill, I see your hand. Thanks, Chair. I wondered if before we discuss this item, if I could get some clarification from legal, whether or not this is competent to bring forward to the board for discussion today. Uh, certainly, Councillor. Um, I think it's maybe a, a slightly unfortunate use of language from the Aberdeen City Council's um, Urgent Business Committee in saying it was a referral to the board because the board is, of course, not a committee of Aberdeen City Council in the normal sense, and um, Aberdeen City Council can't strictly require that the um, IGB considers this as a report. However, having said that, it's still competent for the IGB um, to choose to accept the item um, as a report on the agenda, which has been done in this case. So I'm comfortable that it's uh, competent for the IGB to consider the, the report. But I, I just like for clarity, I um, say that what the board chooses to do or not to do in response to the um, the decision of the Aberdeen City Council's urgent um, business committee and the report is a matter for the members of the, the board and um, there's no requirement to take any particular course of action. Okay, thank you for that, John. Jill, do you want to come back?
Um, I'm happy to listen to some debate, but I have got a comment to make um, if, if, if other people want to speak to the paper first. Okay. Does anybody have any comments to make? It's over to you, Jill. Okay. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, of course, I agree with the first recommendation that the financial officer gives details of the IGB recovery plan to Aberdeen City Council. It's a reasonable request for a partner organisation, and I would assume that NHS Grampian will also wish to see sight of that. And I think that's also a reasonable request for the partner organisation. However, I totally agree, disagree with the second recommendation. I think it's unreasonable uh, from the partner that, that they ask us to consider this. Um, sadly, it would appear that it's an attempt to use this board as a stalking horse to politicise health and social care, and it's not really acceptable. You know, of course, for those people that read the Urgent Business Committee papers and watched the five plus hours of the committal virtually, they will know that it wasn't proposed by rec uh, and recommended by officers. It was an amendment that was put forward by administration councillors and it wasn't unanimously agreed on. There was a, a split in the vote. But it is a yet another blatant attempt to decry the Scottish government instead of discussing the business closest to home. And the board has got very pertinent and important business to discuss, Chair, and it should be used as a vehicle to promote political opinion. It's shameful and the people of Aberdeen suffer as a respect to that. Now, most people in the room know only too well how funding is a portion for health and social care and how Barnet consequentials work. Um, I was talking to a colleague recently who was discussing an article that he'd read in a paper um, from the Institute of Fiscal Services, and they'd recently reported that in England, local authorities spend on adult social care fell by 8% real terms. And a local government association report in 2018 estimated that the social care would face a 1.5 billion funding gap by 2019-20. Now, taking into account fiscal levers which are in place and believing that cuts in spending in England won't impact in Scotland is exceptionally naive. Now, I don't wish to politicise this matter, but of course, if Westminster was to give the Scottish government the fiscal flexibility that they requested, then the Scottish Government would have more money. Um, obviously, this is most likely no. going to have to go no. to a vote because I do not agree to note the second, second recommendation because I think that makes the board complicit in politicising this agenda. Jill, you've just made an incredibly political speech and I will restrain myself from responding in a political manner because I agree with you that that is not how we conduct business in this committee. So I will let your remarks stand and not respond to them, but I'll just note that you have politicised this item by the, by the comments you have just made. All right, I see Luanne and John Tomlinson. Thanks, Sarah. I suppose I'm, I'm I'm thinking that it doesn't tell us anything we we don't already know, and the the issue the question for me is is there any benefit in doing anything further at this moment in time in terms of Scottish government contact around the funding? And my my view is that there isn't because we have we've we've been part of the remobilisation plan that's gone in through NHS Grampian. It's been fully costed. We know our finance is a high risk. We're actively addressing that through through the work that. Uh, through the paper that Alex has later on the agenda. So I, I don't see any benefit in us doing anything further at this stage. And I absolutely don't want our IGB to become party political. We've managed very well to avoid that um, in the past. And, and I, I, I don't want us to go down that road. I think that's that's a danger for us. So my view would be that we, we, we don't, you know, we consider it, but we've got our plans in place for addressing our financial risk and, and that's sufficient for us at present. Thanks, Luan. John. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to clarify on page 24 of the report, at the very top of that page, there's a statement there that says, if this IJB doesn't make representation there and to, to seek additional monies and later finds itself in financial difficulties, can 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 we just have it clarified? I 
thought we have made representation through the mobilization report so that it's a, a collective uh, representation of, of requirements. Can, can we just have that clarified and why that statement reads as it does? I can answer that one, Chair. Um, effectively, when preparing this report, it's just to make the board aware of what risks can arise from any report. And this one does refer to the reputational damage that the risk is mitigated there through the actions of the Chief Finance Officer. So we have explained that, that the development of the medium term financial framework and the long term financial framework um, all mitigate any of those actions. That's all it's there for. It's just highlighting a potential risk. OK, but but the submission of the mobilisation plan and, and it's gone in a second version at the end of July as well, factually means that we've made representation in, in my view, and therefore we are not in the position where we haven't raised uh, the requirements. And, and I think the minute needs to reflect that um, from, from today as well. Yeah, I think it, I think it's very clear that we considered this matter in detail in our meeting in June with the medium term financial forecast and also the details of the mobilisation plan. We have been making representations to the Scottish government to find out when the monies might be forthcoming from that financial mobilisation plan. And we've got item 11 on this agenda where we can have a more detailed discussion with the chief finance officer about the steps that have been taken since the June meeting. So I'm happy to note in, in the minute, um, as John suggests, that representations have been made to the Scottish Government about our funding position. Um, Luan and John, your hands are both still up. Do you want to say something else? No. OK. Um, I, to be honest, I don't see the need for a vote on this. Um, I think we're, we've I, my my view is that we just we just note the recommendations, which are we're going to instruct the chief finance officer to provide details of the relevant reports to the chief officer of finance for Aberdeen City Growth and Resources Committee on the 28th of October, and we'll note the recommendation referred by the Urgent Business Committee, but take no further action on it. Um, I, I I can't emphasise enough how much. As an elected member on this board, I, I welcome and appreciate the fact that this is a non-political committee and I have striven very, very hard as chair to keep it like this. And um, I think the way that we conduct our business is an example to other committees in the council um, where party politics don't have to come into everything and therefore I don't propose to make any further comment on this matter. Jill, I see you at your hand again. Thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome your comments about the IGB not becoming political. Um, I, for the for the reasons that I've already stipulated, I I, I don't wish to uh, note the second recommendation, um, and I would like it noted that I don't accept that. Although I'm happy that you're taking no further action. You're on mute, Sarah. Sorry. Still muted. I have a very jumpy mouse this morning. Sorry about that. Third time. We'll note that in the minutes, Jill, and we'll move on to agenda item nine. And then I propose we take a short break after this item. So this is about the standards officer. Is this Martin who's going to speak to this person? Yeah, that's right, Chair. Um, so the, the, the board has a, a report in front of it, um, which um, outlines the requirement to nominate a replacement standards officer to the Standards Commission. Um, the detail in the report explains that the previous standards officer um, has taken up another job in the Council, and the Chief Officer of Governance in the Council has appointed Jenny Lawson, um, who is the Legal Services Manager, to manage democratic services within governance in the interim. And it is proposed um, or is recommended that um, the IGB nominate the legal service manager as a replacement standards officer to the Standards Commission as detailed in the report. Short and very clear. Does anybody have any comments or questions about this? 
not seeing any hands. So, OK, um, well, it's page 29 of the pack. It's recommended that we nominate the legal services manager as the replacement standards officer, um, as detailed in the report. So that's agreed. That's fine. That was quick. OK, thank you very much, Martin. And um, right, I think. We'll You've muted yourself, Sarah. I definitely need a break and a cup of coffee, don't I? So we'll take a 10 minute comfort break. I suggest people don't actually log out. You just kind of you mute yourself and you put your screens off because there can be issues about people dialing back in and connecting back in again. So I make it 25 past 11. So if we could all be back ready to start again at 25 to 12, that would be very helpful. OK, thank you.
Anybody there? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Sir, I'm here. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Round out to go. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'll assume that people are back on. OK. Right. Well, we'll get going again then. Um, so we're on agenda item 10. So just for the minute, Derek, just to confirm, we've got declarations of interest from Howard, Shona and Alison, but they're all, all going to stay to participate in this item. Yeah, I'm fine with that, Chair. If I can also maybe just suggest, would you maybe like to confirm that you have all your voting members back, seeing as we've had a recess, just so that we remain correct, please? Yes, that's a very good idea. Do you want to do another roll call then? Yes, I'll just limit it to the voting members on this occasion. Yourself, Councillor Duncan's definitely present. I can see Luanne Grugan, who can confirm for me that she is there. I'm not sure if her screen's frozen. Yes. That's I'm present. Councillor Al Samurai? Present. Councillor Bell? Present. Councillor Dunbar? Yes, I'm here. Kim Crutenden? Yes, I'm back. And John Tomlinson? Yes, present. Thank you, Chair. Good, thank you. That's us chorus again then. Thank you. So, uh, carers' expenses policy. Um, is Alison who's going to speak to this? Yes, it is. Thanks. Morning, Alison. Morning. Um, so although this report is entitled uh, Carers Expense Policy, it's important to note that as far as Aberdeen City IJB is concerned, we are proposing that the policy also extends to the service user representative on the IJB. In essence, the proposed policy is intended to remove any financial related barriers to enabling the IGB carers and service users representatives um, to fully embrace their role in participating in IGB business. Um, although we believe um, adopting this policy is the right thing to do, um, it also allows us to achieve an exemplary rating against uh, Proposal 6.3 on the MS MSG self-evaluation framework. Um, the template that was used uh, for the basis of the policy is one that was developed by the Coalition of Carers in Scotland, um, who consulted their network of carers um, in its development. Um, so the, the policy is in front of you. I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Alison. I see Leslie's hand. Um, I just wonder why it's taken so long to get this policy to us. Well, in some respects, it should have been here in, in March. It was developed um, prior to then. Um, but uh, it, it, if you were meaning it should have been early, even earlier than that, um, then yes, uh, I think what this has arisen out of um, some conversations that have taken place with, with carers across Scotland um, uh, in IGBs and their experience of that. Um, so it, it's it's from a lessons learned uh, almost, um, you know, we we carers were, or carers representatives were asked um, what sort of things pre prevented them um, taking up roles uh, in IJBs and um, this is the kind of the information that, that or some of the information that was passed back. Um, so that's one of the reasons um, why it, it, it's with you at this sort of timing. Although, as I said, originally we intended to bring it to the March IJB, but it was deferred as a, a, a non-urgent item of, of business. So we've, we've brought it back now. OK, thank you. OK, I see Shona has a question. Hi, um, it was just a question actually on page 38 of the report. And it was looking at um, the process for claiming expenses. So it says there are named contacts. Just for clarity, would that be yourself, Alison? So that would be uh, Gordon Edgar, who's the development officer for uh, carer and service user engagement. Um, so we'd be linking in with, with Gordon there. 
but right. ultimately, it's so uh, Gordon is a member of my team, so I guess ultimately it 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 would be. That's fine. It was just for clarity to actually have that name contact. That's all. Thank you. Okay, Leslie, your hand's still up. Do you want to come back in? No. Okay. I don't see any other hands. I think. I think Howard, do you want to say something? Not really, no. Um, okay. I, I, I think I accept that it should have been done before. <laughs> but, uh, it was never an issue for me, to be honest. Okay. All right. I think the fact that we haven't got lots of questions is 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 a testament to how clear and concise the policy is. So it's nice to see a policy that's only two pages, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we are asked on page 33 of the pack the recommendation is that we approve the carers policy as attached i think we're content to um, do that so uh, i see alison murray has a quick question she wants oh. to ask hi in the chat. Yeah. hi yes it was just a quick one um it says all the expenses um, prior approval must be sought before any expenses are incurred does that include um having to ask if i can incur a parking <laughs> parking expense before I actually come to every meeting or can we assume that I have approval if the meetings do start taking place in person that I can par pay for parking? Yes, I think that's a routine expense that we would almost expect from you. Um, but yeah, it's 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 if there's any significant expense. So I guess mainly what we were thinking about there is in terms of replacement care. So if there was going to be a significant expense ar around that, we would expect some sort of discussion in advance. I, I wonder then if it needs to be clarified when it says the following are in on page 37, the following are included, but prior approval must be sought before any expenses are occurred, yeah. that certain expenses um, would be, as you say, routine and yeah. wouldn't like parking to attend a meeting. So we could perhaps add the word significant in, in, yeah. in front, any significant expenses incurred. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks for that. I think we're happy to approve the recommendation and therefore the policy. Right. Thank you very much, Alison. Thank you. Uh, item 12 is the updated strategic risk register. Martin. Um, I think there's item 11 before that, sorry, Chair. You're on mute. Yep. I'm working on an old pack and uh, it's the the quarterly financial monitoring and mobilisation update, which is in the supplementary circulation that came out. Uh, Alex. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just to, just to kind of highlight the, the the position as we have at the moment, um, it's largely as we anticipated in June uh, when, when we had that first conversation around about what the funding is. As you'll see, we've been um, paragra uh, paragraph 3.9, um, forecasting a, a, an overspend at the end of year of 11.5 million, but a significant level of that is forecast to come from the, the Scottish Government in relation to the cost of the mobilisation plan. We pulled out there the direct costs, which are the costs that we're largely spending on social care providers, and the indirect costs are are, are largely in relation to savings that haven't been uh, haven't been delivered as, as as we walk as we go through this process. Um, at this stage, and 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 based on 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 some of the conversations, we we agreed not to pull a a, a recovery plan together, but wait to see what's happening with the the level of financial co uh, confirmation around about the level of financial commitment from the Scottish government at the end of September, and and the, and the recommendation is that we 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 call a, a special meeting of the IGB if required uh, to uh, early October to, to to discuss any any gap that may be remaining after that after that uh, there. So it's pleasing to see the mainstream position largely moving along as 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 as, 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 as we expected. And as I say, based on the on the predictions that we had in June, uh, that 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 was um, where, where we thought we would be. Just one little other th uh, part. There's there's more money that's being released by the Scottish government, and there's another fifty million pounds, twenty five million pounds that has now been uh, confirmed that that will be coming through to the IGBs and that is 
I, I, my, my understanding is that that's £900,000 worth to, to, to Aberdeen City Council, Aberdeen City IGB, sorry, which will be, feed, will be feeding into the council side of our accounts. So, so that's all I, I really want to say in terms of the report. In terms of the appendices, there's a, 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 um, a there's a, there's a, there's a correction that needs to be made in relation to the uh, Appendix B and the Community Health Services, and you'll see the figures in there don't actually add back to that £530,000 overspend. And the, and the reason for the difference in that is in relation to underspends on, on staffing costs. So that's all I was going to say, uh, Chair. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. OK, Philip and then Kim. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, I wonder if you could clarify a point for me, please. Uh, item 3.6. Um, so item, item 3.6 says that um, let's receive now so another tranche of funding totaling 50 millions will be passed through to the IJPs. You just said 25 millions. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so my understanding is that um, the, the the twenty five million was passed across, and I've actually got confirmation of that. It just came in yesterday. The the remaining twenty five million, I, I I think they're waiting to see what the implications are on the cash flow, as in the cash it's actually gone out of the organisation before deciding how they're going to release that. The the initial twenty five million has been released on the the GAE um, and um, NRAC. Uh, formula, which which has come through from there, so we're still waiting on that, but that's that's part of the process that we're going through as it sits at the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, Kim. Um, I, was, I was actually just looking for a bit of clarity, and it may be just the the, the way that I'm reading the report. So, um, the point three twelve. Um, I appreciate, you know, being a pharmacist, that 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 there's significant um, challenges around prescribing and around um, budgeting, etc. Um, but I'm just trying to get a bit of clarity around this. So, so we've only got one month, one month of actual data, and we know there was a there was a spike in prescribing um, due to COVID. But we think, if you look at Appendix A, what we've got is a you know a period budget and a period actual. Yeah. So that doesn't. So that that would suggest to me that we know what we've spent in that period, but and it's also on. You know, it's actually um, where we should be. Um, but with that spike, I would be suggesting we may not be overspending at this point in the year. I'm just looking for some clarity as to how it, we came to the uh, it being all right. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so the situation we're prescribing is, is, is as follows: at the end of the um, at the end of the financial year, there was a spike within the last two months of the financial year, and the Scottish government gave us additional funding to cover that. So we didn't have a uh, an, an issue, and and that money was largely around about the demand and the increase of demand, and that demand was proved to be correct. And, and basically what we've seen as we've gone into the new financial year, as the demand is starting to drop off. So for April and May, the demand we can see the demand, the demand starting to reduce. Um, the what what we're also seeing though is that we're seeing that the that there's an increase in the price. Uh, that you know they, they forecast this on a kind of average unit cost of the price, and they're seeing that the unit cost, uh, the average unit cost is is increased. Um, so they're keeping a close eye on that as it sits at the moment because there's a there's a worry that if that if that moves forward throughout the whole financial year that there there may be an overspend on this budget. At the time when when I was pulling this report together, we only ever have we're two months behind in terms of invoicing for um, for 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 the uh, for for prescribing, and and therefore we need to they, they they make estimates and they they make adjustments in the accounts to reflect what they think it's going to be in the in the, to, to account for the two months that they don't have. So really, this position was based on one month's worth of information, and now what we need to do is to keep a close eye on this one just to see how it's moved. If I'd been if, if you know there'll be different practices taken out throughout Scotland about what, what people are doing and, and some of that will be dependent on what your what your um on, on, on what the circumstances were that made up your budget. Um, but as it sits at the moment we're forecasting a break even. I wouldn't be surprised to see that figure move within the next within the next set of monitoring. But as I say, there's the it's still very early days in, in, in terms of forecasting this and, and then figuring out what's going to happen with the prescribing budget going forward. 
there's obviously um, implications in terms of the price and, and, and we've talked about this before in terms of what countries are, are, are making the drugs and, 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 and we've also seen some impacts in the past around about Brexit and how that may impact on on drug, uh, you know, on, 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 on people um, going in um, and, 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 and getting more drugs because because of concerns around about um, various Brexit deadlines. But then I, I also think that what we might now start to see is some impacts of Brexit making its way through to the unit price. I hope that gives you some assurance, but just really early days at the moment and we're working our way through it. Um, thanks. Yeah, it does. I, I guess it's just looking at the, you know, at your table with the budget and the actual. I'm just wondering, so are there lots of other um, items in that table that are based on educated estimates as well then is you know is what we're looking at because if you know if, if there's only one month for the prescribing based on th three three months that have passed is there quite a lot of other ones that are so, so you know. some of them will be it depends on what the profile of the budget is so some will have um some will be split evenly across the piece and in, in terms of you divide it by 12 and you've got your number a month within there and they make ass adjustments and assess assessments around about that from my perspective the area where i normally place the most focus is not on what's happening in the period today and in that it's on the forecast at the end of the financial year because i think that's the bit that we're kind of um we're kind of monitored against is, is what does the position look at like at the end the financial year so certainly throughout my career I've always put a lot of focus on the forecast and, and, and less focus on the period to date uh, and in the, the period budgets. Okay I see Jill and then John. Hey thanks Chair. Um, I have two questions for Alec. Um, I'm just wondering from your discussions with other chief financial officers of other IGBs, um, whether or not they have incorporated within their indirect costs of COVID any savings efficiencies that they haven't managed to bring forward during this period. And my second question is around about page seven at 3.14, you've talked about uh, high level discussion about a cost reduction programme and I wondered if you could give me any more information about that and sort of time scales when the board would expect to see it delivering on anticipated cost savings. Thank you. So in relation to the first question about uh, indirect costs, it was uh, it's on everybody's mobilisation plan as it sits at the moment, undelivered savings. So most of the IGBs across Scotland will have put something in for that in terms of of of, of you know the the savings that they've not been able to generate because they've been dealing with COVID. So uh, I would expect to see a pretty consistent position across the country in in regard to that. What we might have seen, or what you might see in terms of our finances and how they may differ from some of the other areas is some of the other areas might have assumed the level of income that they were going to get in. So I've taken a very prudent view and just said that the figure is 11.4 million and um, I've shown you what the makeup of that is. You may find in some areas that they've actually assumed that they'll get the majority of that 11 million pounds from the Scottish Government and therefore are only showing an overspend of 400,000. So just a little bit of context around that when you see some of the figures coming out, it depends on, on how, how, how it's actually been presented presented and I've presented it on this basis because it kind of ties in with the discussions in the paper that we had in June and I think it's quite clear therefore to the board around about what where, where the level of uh, where the level of financial risk kind of lies. In relation to your question about recoveries, um, yeah, I mean, certainly myself and the chief uh, chief officer have been having a number of conversations around about this. There are there are some financial advantages that will likely come through some some of the work that we're doing in terms of the um, operation home first. That's not the that's not the primary driver for doing operation home first. The, the primary driver is making sure that we've got um, sustainable services through the winter and through the uh, any second wave, but there is there 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 will be some uh, financial savings that potentially could come through that process. And the areas that we've kind of been looking at are in relation to some of the stuff around about locum spend, and um, 
in, 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 in them, so, so, some of our assumptions around about vacancies and so on going forward. So, 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 so there are there are some there are some things in there. We've also got um, the transformation program uh, and 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 the. Uh, and, and some of the projects that were were there and, and potentially bringing them back up again. So, so I, I, my feeling is that there are opportunities there for for us to save money going forward. But you know, we we need to get confirmation on how much money that is. And if there was, uh, you know, what would happen is that if if we are required to actually bring that forward to the board, depending on the level of funding that, that that's confirmed, then then the IGB would get sight of that in October uh, at the at the for at that that meeting in early October. Mm. Thanks for the clarity. Thanks, Chair. John, you next, and then um, Jenny and Philip again. Okay, th uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for the comprehensive report. Um, w one of the, the risks going forward, or, or something that um, I, I would want to just better understand and so be assured on it, is, is around um, what the picture is in, in care homes. Because um, at one level, are we needing to fund vacancies and will that continue and is that part of our direct costs um, at another level th there's a kind of concern at some point of of the sustainability of some places if they're not getting um, uh, new people coming in so uh, and so I apologize if if I should know a bit more about this but um, it just feels like it's one aspect of this which potentially is a, is a risk going forward so it'd be just helpful to hear a bit more around the position with that. So when when the accountants looked at the the budget monitoring position, um, I, I mean certainly on the council side, it was looking as if it was largely coming in as in, in, in terms of what we we had anticipated. But I, I would say, I mean, again, it's still very early days in, in relation to the spend that we've gone through in regard to the care homes, because you know there will be some some delays in, in terms of. Putting, putting amounts through the through the ledger, um, as as people have been dealing with COVID, maybe some of their invoice and procedures and practices haven't been as efficient as as potentially they they may have been if if COVID hadn't been there. My my feeling is that um the, at the moment what we're doing is we're, we're providing additional payments out to the social care providers and and that's largely around about the PPE, uh um sickness and and additional staffing that they've required over that piece to to maintain their services during the first lockdown or the you know the first wave, and and the, largely that cost going through the direct costs. What what was agreed um, was that you know that that level of support would would last until September, and that there would be some tapering down of that level of support. And 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 I think um, colleagues across the country are now looking at what that level of taper down means. But 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 my feeling is that there is one area where where there potentially may be savings that come forward uh, going forward, and that would be in relation to the care home residential care home setting, and 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 potential under occupancy within these areas. But we need to we need to see what that looks like before I made any um made made it made an assumption on that in in relation to the finances that it sits at the moment because it's still very early days to say that, and I'm also mindful of uh, of, of of some of the sustainability payments are going out as well. OK, thank you. And we can pick that up again in October, uh, I guess, in, in, in the update at that point. Thanks. Definitely. Jenny and then Luann. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Um, it was under Appendix B, uh, the bit around community health services, um, and it mentions the underspend in nursing and allied health professionals. I guess it's not a term that I'm very used to um, and I wondered if you could maybe just say a bit more about where where they have where they've arisen from, please. Yeah, um, yeah basically just vacancies that have not been filled uh, due to recruitment difficulties within the HP and nursing services. Is, is, is really where that comes from. Um, we've had that for, for, for a while in terms of, you know, struggling to recruit to these 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 professions. So it's, it's not a new thing, but it's certainly something that we need to be mindful of. OK, thank you. Um, 
Will I go now, Sarah? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, just two questions, um, Alex. One about our risk fund, and I'm wondering, given that many IGBs won't have such a fund, has there been any sort of indication from Scottish government as to their expectations that we we use that risk fund to, to help um, to help make our finances good this year? So that's my first question, and the second one is um, on point three. 3.11 where it talks about level of funding not being confirmed around Action 15, PSIP and ADP. Just wanted to understand that a bit more, um, to, to understand that risk a little bit more, please. Yeah, so 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 uh, I haven't seen anything um, that said that we would need to use our risk, our, our risk fund or our reserves to kind of close that, uh, close any gap as it sits at the moment. Um, but we'll, we'll, you know, We'd need to, you know, so I can't really give you a position on that as it sits at, it sits at, at this time. But I do think that there is, um, you know, fr from our own perspective, I wouldn't be encouraging us to use that risk fund at this stage in the financial year. I think if, if we did come up with a gap uh, following the confirmation of the funding, then I would be encouraging us to try and uh, get that gap back in back in line again. Um, because I think it's quite early days to to be relying on on having a small risk fund there to to close any gap. But we'll need to we need to kind of keep an eye on that because it, it may be that that they say that use use some of these use the reserves if you've got them. But we'll need to we'll need to be we'll need to take that once once we see what actually happens. Obviously, some you know we we've got a small risk fund. Some some areas have got bigger funds, uh, bigger bigger amounts in reserves than than us. So certainly something to be wary of or or, or to think about. It's as we go forward and then in, in terms of the 3.11 the the, the the funding for the specific earmarked funds um yeah we we have received information from from requesting us to provide what we think will be the likely level of spend to to be be required this financial year that just came out um i think at the end of last week uh, that request for information and 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 this will be an important part of the government actually deciding and, and providing clarity on the level of funding that we'll receive so providing them with an actual level of spend that we're likely to incur will, will help move that process forward the area that's you know the area that we need to kind of keep an eye on is around about the immunizations because the immunizations um team are you know we're creating that team and that's been agreed by the igb previously that you were you know that we're going to create a new team because that responsibility was removing from the the gps into into the community and and therefore you know what we need to do is to keep moving forward with that team and we'll be putting these projections into our level of spend which is likely to be incurred this financial year OK, thanks, Alex. OK. Um, OK, I don't see any other hands up. Um, unless I'm missing somebody. No. Right. Thank you for that, Alex. And thank you for the very comprehensive report. Um, the recommendations are on page four of the pack. So we've noted the report in relation to the budget and the information on the areas of risk management action that's contained within the report. We're agreeing that we'll call a special meeting of the IJB in accordance with Standing Order 9 should the funding position confirmed by the Scottish Government in October not cover the requirements of the IJB. And we're approving the budget, budget environments indicated in Appendix F. So we're all agreeable to those recommendations? Great, yeah. Okay. The best position would be if we didn't need a special meeting in October because the Scottish Government just gives us the 11.4 million that we need. Um, so fingers crossed that that's actually what happens. Right. Now, we're back to Martin again, and thank you very much for keeping me right about last the, the order of business. So, risk register. Yeah, um, thanks, Chair. Um, so the board has before it the, the most up-to-date version of the strategic risk register. As explained in the report, um, IGB members have been receiving updates from the chief officer, um, which included strategic risks and how the risks have been affected by the pandemic and how the partnership has been mitigate, mitigating against the risks and introducing new controls. Um, so since the register was last submitted to the IGB at the start of the year, um, the, the leadership team had drafted a specific risk on COVID-19 
Um, this was um, drafted early on in response to the pandemic and provided details of controls and mitigating actions. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the officers in the partnership have been providing members of the board with, with updates on strategic risks and details of action taken. And um, they have been embedding um, these risks into the, the, the 10 strategic risks you see before yourself today. Um, so this approach has basically consolidated the, the COVID-19 risks into the overall strategic risk register. Um, just maybe touching upon some movement um, since the last time the board saw the register, um, members will notice that strategic risk two, which is the, the financial risk, has been raised from high to very high um, to emphasise the discussion that um, we just had uh, and under Alex's report. Um, so the risk owners or someone representing them are in attendance today to answer any questions that the, the members may have. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So I have opened up to everybody for comments and questions. Jill. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm not sure if it's just my papers, but I found the risk register quite difficult to read. Um, I found the fact that some of the risks are overlapping on multiple pages quite confusing. I mean, I don't know if it's just the way that my papers have presented themselves on my computer, but I wondered if there was any scope, if that's how everybody's seeing them, if they could be clearly separated from each other. Um, the other question that I have is around about the lack of movement in the risk for the risk of impact of Brexit. I just wondered if I could have some more clarity about why that risk still just remains at high and that wasn't changed to very high, if that's possible. Thank you. Um, thanks uh, through you, Chair. I'm happy to, to look at the, the formatting of the report. Um, we're going to be submitting this to the, the, the Risk Audit and Performance Committee later on this month, so we'll, we'll look at that um, as well as future copies coming to the IJB. Um, in terms of the EU exit risk, um, maybe if I can get to that point, I'll maybe just update in terms of the, the kind of comments um, that we've received. I mean, it, basically, both the partnership is, in terms of controls, as members of the, the, the appropriate um, groups, both in Aberdeen City Council and NHS Grampian, in relation to EU exit. Um, and there has been, I suppose, um, the, 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 there have been um, movements in terms of setting up meetings, etc., uh, in relation to the EU exit. So I think we're in a good position to contribute and get the students, etc., or provide the students um, in relation to that. Um, but I suppose there hasn't been too many meetings in relation to that in the last few months, and therefore that's probably the reason why there's been no change in relation to the risk rating. Hey, thanks for the clarity there. Thank you. OK, Philip and then John. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'm, I'm interested that um, Councillor Al Samurai also uh, mentioned that um, the the, the risk um, matrices are, are very hard to read. Can I draw your attention to page 79, please, to Appendix 2? Just so we can just, just have, a, have a look at really why I think it is a little confusing the way things are laid out. So, um, so at, at Appendix 2, it, it, uh, we have a tabulation of impact and consequences. We've got, uh, and with all the, with the descriptors from negligible all the way through to extreme, uh, we've got uh, likelihood definitions. Um, and, and then we have um, the consequences and the impact. Now, my understanding of risk is that you have um, impact, you have likelihood, and that gives you your overall risk. And then you perhaps put mitigations in place. And I can't, I can't actually easily work that out from the way this appendix two translates to the information we've got in the risk register. Perhaps I'm misreading that as well. Um, it isn't particularly clear. So so really, so the whole point of really what I'm saying is if uh, if register isn't particularly clear the way it's been defined, then it's it's really very hard to actually challenge it. Um, now I'm sure it's been put together in good faith, but there could be things perhaps that have been missed. 
or there could there could have been things that have perhaps been overemphasized, which didn't ought to, to be um, is really Can I, um, can, I, can I just come in here before you, Martin? Um, I think if we're going to say that, Philip, you need to give some examples of what you think could have been missed. This is this is how both the council and the NHS assess and then report risk in their strategic re risk registers. So this isn't a new process that we have taken on board as a partnership by ourselves. This is this is this is the process that's used by both of our main partners. And to be honest, I'm not very happy at the implication that the risk register is missing something big. And I think if you're going to say that, you need to give some examples of what you think is being missed. OK. Um, so so you, you will agree, uh, Chair, that, the, that the, uh, the appendix I just mentioned actually details how risk is defined. That, that, that's a given, isn't it? So if I look at, let's say I look at the, the, uh, the first item on the, on the register, uh, and I take on board exactly what you're, when you're, what you're saying. So if I look at the first, let me just look at um, um, page 64, um, description of risk, failure of transformation to deliver sustainable systems change, which helps the IJB deliver its strategic priorities. Um, and it's, it's listed as high. Um, and the rationale is recognition of known demographic. Um, but I don't actually see, oh, in description of risk, failure of transformation to deliver sustainable systems change. The rationale is recognition of the known demographic, demographic curve and financial change challenges. Um, and that's shown as high and no change. Well, okay, well, we know that that is true, but. There's also controls there, transformation, governance, mitigating actions. It's very hard to actually work out ultimately how you, how this is all truly defined. But you're, you're, you're puzzling, Chair. I, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not clear. I don't know whether others think it's absolutely crystal clear. Maybe it's just me. Um, I'm just going to say through yourself, Chair. Um, just a couple of things. I suppose the um, the, the, the template that, that the IGB has adopted um, was recommended as, as good practice um, through the Good Governance Institute um, when we set up the Strategic Risk Register um, and has been um, the, the template we've been using recently. Um, I was also going to say there is a, there is a planned workshop, um, IGB workshop on strategic risk and strategic planning, um, I think in October, and it's maybe an opportunity to, to, to look at the 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 template if or um, and the formatting um if if that would be helpful at that point okay thank you yeah yeah no obviously we want we want a risk register that people understand um and that people feel comfortable with so we, we it was a, i think it was a year ago that we did a workshop on it um I think risk audit and performance and clinical and care governance have also got a program of looking at individual risks. Now that's fallen into abeyance because of COVID and that is something that we need to pick up again. But I think the workshop in October is very welcome because it'll give us a chance to discuss this in detail, I think. Um, I was, I was, yeah, I was looking puzzled at Philip's comments because I, I do see the connection between needing to needing to tackle demographic change and it being a risk to our system if we don't have transformation to do that. But maybe we do need, in the workshop, we need to explore whether the description of the mitigation actions is correct and appropriate now. And, and I agree with you, Philip, that maybe we need to give more specific examples of the mitigating actions that are actually being taken rather than just saying we're, we're, taking, we're taking action on transformation. So. Okay, thanks. Okay, John and Luanne. Um. Okay, thank you. Um, in, in some ways, mine follows on quite well from what uh, Philip has been saying. Um, I draw attention to page 63. So we're dealing with risk six and it's got a medium rating and it's around reputation. And on page 63 under mitigating actions, um, 
I can see what we're doing in terms of our, our own governance and I can I, the feedback that we've got around staff has been very positive as well. So on that basis, that, that ranking looks fine. When I was reading through this, I was wondering about the public aspect and I don't see too much in the actions there around the public aspect. And when we, you know, putting it into the context of what we heard earlier around um, Chris Littlejohn's uh, briefing and the, the public needing to sh move into living with COVID, there is quite a bit of uncertainty uh, around that. So I'm, I'm confident of the actions that we're, we've been taking, but it does seem to me that around the public side, it's possible that that, that becomes um, quite high profile. And if it does, it's major. Now, if you put the possible and the major together, it is actually uh, on that um, page 79, a high risk. So whilst we might want to say, well, we're doing OK with the staff side, I am curious about the, the, the public side of that. So I would be, be assured if I could hear a bit more about what feedback we're getting from the public and just putting a marker down that when we do review this, that's one that uh, I, I think we need a bit more information on, on, on the mitigating side. Okay, thanks, um, John, through, through yourself, Chair. Um, I know that Graham Lothers on, on the line, um, and he would certainly be able to provide some detail in terms of um, communication with um, the press, the national press, local press, etc. cetera. Um, if, and also, I think we, we can look at the um, providing a bit more in terms of the controls and mitigating actions in relation to, you know, how we are managing the, the re reputation of, of the board with the public as well. Graham, do you want to come in here? Do you want to say something? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was struggling to unmute there. <laughs> Shades of yourself there, Sarah. Um, there is a great deal of effort goes into public communications as well as the internal uh, staffing. Communications. Um, it could maybe be reflected more strongly, perhaps in this register. Um, the website is regularly updated with public information. Um, there is regular social media activity to back that up and to direct people to information on the website. Um, in terms of maybe the larger messaging, an awful lot of it is carried by NHS Grampian and the Scottish Government in terms of the areas that Chris was talking about earlier on. So those those would be my observations on that matter. OK, thank you. Can I come in again, Chair? Um, yeah, so again, yeah, I, I, I see some of the messaging and, and we are very active and proactive in, in what we're putting out. Because my, my question is also about what are we getting back from the public? So in terms of it being a two way exchange, what, what are we hearing? And does that give us assurance that uh, that, that people are content or, or are there any issues there? Uh, Chair, could I could I come in there? So I guess I guess what, what I was saying is I, I take on board the comments around about that. And, and you know, if there's a workshop environment, then that would be the place to de delve into that in a little bit more detail. Um, and I understand what John's saying as well about the repu um, reputational stuff and, and that being two ways. So there's certainly something that we will need to have a look at in, in, in regard to that and seeing how that impacts on on, on, on our decision making and, and, and delegation of the services. I guess um, the, the bit that, that I'm always, you know, want to sort of point out in relation to, to, to this risk register is that this registers in relation to risks that will impact on the delivery of our strategic plan. Plan. Um, so, so it's slightly different than than some of the the, the operational risks, uh, which which are covered elsewhere. So, just really wanted to just to clarify that position, but do take on board the comments that uh, John and Philip have, have have made. No, I think that's useful. I'm happy to to leave it at that, where we will be reviewing it again. I think you know we have reflected at past IJB meetings that we're only now getting into some of the big changes that are going to be needed and, and might become a bit more controversial in terms of uh, public and, and, and how they need to get into self-management, etc. So I think it is a relevant one and, and welcome us having a, an informal discussion at some point soon. Thanks. 
Okay, now that, that's a helpful reminder that this is the strategic risk register and not the operational risk register. Um, Luan. I'm, I was just going to highlight that we are having this the seminar in October, which has already been mentioned, but maybe just to get clarity from people about whether we should be looking at the whole risk register in that seminar, in that workshop, or if there are specific risks that people are feeling are unclear, you know, it might be helpful for, for Martin to certainly get that ahead of October so we can get the best of, of that time we're, we're going to have together in October. I don't know if the thinking right now is that that's for the, the full review of all the risks um, in, in that workshop, or is that something we've still to figure out? Um, yeah, I think that's a, it's a really helpful suggestion. In the past, we have focused on, I think the last time was were the, the high and very high risks. Um, but I think given time restraints of everyone, it would be good to kind of get an, an understanding of what risks that the board want to focus on, on the, in October. Okay. Um, I think we need a mechanism for doing that then. So I think it would be helpful if Derek put out a request to board members and if people are, have particular risks that they would like to focus on, they feed them back through Derek to you, Martin, so you can do some preparation for the workshop. So we'll work out a timing for that email and a deadline to reply. Um, and that means that we can focus on the areas that board members are particularly concerned about in this register. OK, thank you. Right. I'll put that email out tomorrow, Chair, while it's fresh in everybody's memory, this conversation, and I'll allow them to focus and save some time. OK, some homework for us to do then. That's good. All right. Philip, are you happy with the with the, the way that we're going to handle this going forward? Yes, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's fine. I don't see any other hands. Um, Luanne, have you got another comment to no, make? No. Right, okay. I'll just get back to the right page. So we're being asked to approve the revised strategic risk register. Are we content to do that given that we've got the workshop in October? Are people, should we note it and then have a recommendation to um, Discuss it in October and then revert, then have it back to back to the board in December. Given the comments that have been made about some of the risks in particular, I would be happy with that. Yeah, Jill, I see your hand. Uh, yeah, just going to say that would be a good course of action to proceed forward with this one. Okay. Okay. Right. So we've got a revised recommendation is that we're going to note the strategic risk register. We're going to note that there's going to be a workshop in October. We can provide the date in the recommendation. That would be helpful. And that we'll receive it again in December to approve it then. Okay. All noted. That's it. Item 13, right, is Operation Home First. Um, Gail, is it Gail? Liz? Yeah, um, thanks Sarah, I'll, I'll cover this paper. So this paper builds on the paper that you received last time um, on their immediate response to the COVID situation and also builds on the paper you received in March about the um, financial, um, our medium term financial framework. So um, the report you have in front of you sets out the relationships between the medium term financial framework and specifically the five priority objectives that are at the heart of the framework and the agreed programme of transformation as well as the ambitions and activities of Operation Home First, both in terms of the initial response and our ongoing response. So it demonstrates and shows as, a, as, a, as an image that shows you how, how all of these different things are interrelated, just to provide assurance that we are um, progressing in line with our strategic plan. So the, what we're delivering as a result of, of our response to COVID and our ongoing living with COVID are directly aligned with our strategic plan and our agreed programme of transformation and our medium term financial framework. 
So the, the ambition of Operation Home First, as presented to you last time, is about maintaining people safely at home, avoiding unnecessary hospital admissions, um, or attendance and supporting early discharge back to a homely environment after essential special, specialist care. So it's absolutely in line with our strategic plan. We are developing a number of indicators, performance indicators, which will evidence how successful um, and, and the impact of the changes that we're making against our strategic plan and the aims of Operation Home First. So we'll bring that back to the Risk Audit and Performance Committee um, next month um, and that's still being worked up in terms of the, the commission around what we're hoping to achieve there. We, in the report last time, we outlined the initial um, 11 main responses to the COVID situation and we're now in a different position in terms of our, our response of living with COVID and this paper brings um, to your attention an update on a number of different programmes and projects which are aligned with Operation Home First Again, thinking about how, how do we continue to provide services in a safe way while supporting people to, to maintain it in a homely environment in the safest possible place for them as appropriate to their needs. So there's a detail of all, all the projects and also the medium term financial framework um, pro programmes. And we've also included some flash reports to give you a little bit more detail around these projects. We do intend to share with you flash reports on a regular basis through the informal communications mechanisms we have in place with IJB, but this allows you as an IJB to consider those flash reports and if you have any questions you can you can ask them. So we're, we're recommending today that you note the current progress towards progressing Operation Home First in the city, which is in line with our strategic plan, and you note that further reports will be brought back to IJB as we move beyond the initial COVID response and as specific decisions are, are required in due course. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gail. Leslie, you first and then John. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you. Um, Gail, that's um, really helpful. I think it's good to hear that there's, um, you know, like considerable progress in a sense coming um, with this. Um, I just wanted a little bit more detail in terms of, you know, like how you're going to gather evidence um, to show success. OK, so the detail for that is, is currently being worked up and will be shared with the Risk Audit and Performance Committee. There'll be a range of different mechanisms. We'll be, we'll be looking at the impact to the, the people who are being supported, the impact to the staff who are supporting the people who need care, and the impact on the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve. So that is a work in progress and we'll bring more detail to the Risk Audit and Performance Committee next month. Are you also going to look at, sorry, I might have missed this, but are you going to look at impact to carers? Yes. Okay. Okay, if I, you want me to come in now? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, no, I very much welcome the report and it's good to see the, the progress of this over the successive ways that you're reporting to us. Um, so, and, and very much welcome the uh, linking up of the different strands of the strategy so we can see that holistically. I think that's very helpful. I think it indicates that bringing through the indicators is going to be uh, key to this and, and being able to almost see very simply what it is that's shifting um, in the population and still where the gaps are. So I'd be very keen that the indicators uh, indicate how the projects can make a shift, but also tell us where the gaps remain uh, in terms of our ambitions for integration. So there's the two aspects. A specific question um, is in terms of the dashboard. So will these indicators be incorporated in the dashboard or are they separate? Can you just say something about that, please? OK, so um, in, in terms of the, the overall dashboard, um, that's a sort of management tool that we use to, to monitor progress across all of the, the programmes we have in place. Uh, the flash reports provide that, that update to you. Uh, the flash reports will provide performance indicators when those are available and to the right level and the right type of performance indicators. I hope that answers your question. 
Um, well, I, I just want to be able to understand where the different indicators sit. So, uh, because together they they paint the picture of of, of progress. Um, but we can have a look at that when when you report next month to the to the RAP committee. So that, that's fine for now. Thank you. Okay, Luan. Thanks, Sarah. Um, just to echo what John was saying, it's really helpful to see the home first put in the context of our previous our existing strategy and, and our medium term financial um, plan. So thank you for that. It's really good to see it all brought together. Mine are just really comments and, and, and I'm thinking you'll, you'll already be thinking about that, but they're on exactly the same topic, which is about how we measure the success of this. So, so one is a question really about when we're looking at performance, will we be measuring our performance more widely than, you know, at the moment it's focused on hospital and community flow, but are we looking at things like our prevention activity and resilience? I'm thinking, you know, around mental health, for example. So, so that's one bit. And then I'll, I'll just give you my other two bits that um, I'm interested in. How are we going to measure any impact on health inequalities? that um, come through ho Operation Home First. And by that, I'm thinking we don't want to have any unintended consequences of widening any gaps. You know, I'm thinking particularly th through digital. So, you know, what's what's the thinking around health inequalities? And also, are we linking finance uh, success indicators as well? So for each of the flash reports, you know, will there be an expectation that we balance a budget or there's a reduction or, or whatever. So it's just to get a sense of are those three areas being looked at in, in the, the performance indicators that you're working on, Gail? Uh, thank you, Lauren. So firstly, in relation to your first question about the sort of normal health related performance indicators, we obviously have a lot of data related to health performance indicators. And one of the things we're very clear about is they're a really important part of the picture, but they're not the whole picture. So we need to be measuring the right things to tell us a story that we need to demonstrate that we are um, hopefully delivering against our strategic plan. So we're doing quite a lot of work in relation to that at the moment in terms of de really defining down and honing down what the commission is in relation to what it is we need to, to measure in order to indicate whether or not um, we are making the progress that we hope to make. So that's a really complex piece of work um, and um, we're, we're progressing on that, but it's, it, it's, I don't think it's really been achieved before. So um, it'll probably be a bit of a, a work in progress and we'll need to keep honing it down as an, and improving in relation to making sure we are measuring the right things as well as the things that are easy to, to measure. In relation to health inequalities, Absolutely, that's that's such an important thing at the moment, and we know from the data we have, we've, one of the one of the really positive things about the current situation is we have a lot of data coming out at the moment, and we know there is that very clear evidence that those who are being hit hardest by by COVID, those who are um, the majority, uh, greatest proportion in the shielding category, for example, a lot of those those individuals um, have other socioeconomic challenges. So we, we've, we need to focus very clearly on our health inequalities and particularly in relation to the work we're doing in, in partnership with City Council in relation to Aberdeen Together, that is um, seeking to put that very much as a focus and the work we're doing um, in partnership with NHS Grampian, particularly around the, 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 the gaps or the opportunities around self-management. We know that people have been managing their conditions over the last four months. Um, in different ways than they might have normally managed their conditions. So there's an opportunity there to, to really build on that um, into the future. Um, and, and finally, your, your final question was about financial um, success indicators. Absolutely, all, all of this is, is, is wrapped around the, what, what we're delivering in terms of health and social care, what the needs of our populations are, what, what the gaps are, what the health inequalities are, and doing that all within the, the financial envelope we have available to us. So it's a really a really big challenge, but absolutely that, that goes throughout the, the heart of it. That's great. Thank you, Gail. OK, Leslie, I see your hand up. Do you want to come in again? No, OK, so I've got Philip and I saw Sandra as well earlier. Thank you, Chair. Um, so my question really is related to um, page 87. And that's the partnership GP practice re remodeling. Um, so 
it actually says um, uh, enhancing the sustainability and efficiencies of our partnership managed GP practices um, by uh, taking into consideration patient profile uh, and then uh, just below that uh, deliver a coordinated response to unscheduled care needs across Aberdeen City. Could you perhaps elaborate on what that means a little bit more? So that's uh, so, partnership GP practice remodeling and stepped care approach. Okay, so those those are two different but interconnected programs of work. So the partnership GP practice remodeling relates to what we typically refer to as our 2C practices. So those are the GP practices that are run and managed by through the partnership as opposed to being independently run. The majority of, pract of GP practices in the city are independently run. We've got a number that are managed by the partnership. Those some of those practices um, um, have particular challenges and there's opportunities to Im improve how they're collectively operated to benefit the people who receive services through those practices. So that's a, a fairly significant piece of work and um, a, a paper will be coming to that with um, more detail on that later on this, this year, the next couple of months, potentially October. The step care approach is about how we join up our, our, our teams of, of primary and community care um, people providing support in our community. So that includes our, our people who are employed through, through the NHS and the council working for the partnership and also our partners in our um, care at home and, and care homes as well. So how do we provide um, and support a, a holistic joined up approach to the provision of care? recognise that we need the right support at the right moment in time in terms of different levels of care. So that would include, for example, our hospital at home, providing acute care in the community, right down to our, our activities to enable people to support themselves as well as they possibly can so they don't need care and support. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, and that, that, that's, uh, that's, a, that's quite interesting. So you, so you, you say, though, um, that there, uh, Gail, there's going to be a quite a big piece of work that, that we'll, we'll actually be reading about the patient profile, um, which clearly will be related to stepped care approach as, as well, I guess. Yeah, anyway, thanks very much. Sandra, do you want to come in here and then we'll take Alison? Yeah, Alison please. Nice. Just really to support what Gail's saying, the stepped care approach is really um, based on how we deliver services and it's whether, as Gail suggested, it's um, directly from a self-managed independent way right up to um, acute care, which is effectively hospital at home. That will be based on, it is based on each of the localities, um, Councillor Bell, so that's how we will go around there. The patient profile within the GP practices is relating to how we analyse and look at and consider the 2C practices, what, what the local population is, what the needs are and how we can redesign that based with them. So I think the, the two things are not, um, I, I'm not quite, they, they look separate in the table. They, they're, they're two separate pieces of work. Obviously they will be interconnected, but not directly. Um, de they're interdependencies, but not totally dependent on each other. Yeah, thanks. I, I understand that. Thank you. Alison, Alison Murray. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I keep being thrown off my Wi-Fi, so I hope I, I don't this time. Um, there's a lot there which will have a big impact on carers, some paid carers at home. Um, I, I know you just said that the impact on carers will be considered, though it isn't actually discussed in the document. Um, I was wondering to what extent you've um, worked with carers to um, actually develop this, because obviously anything where somebody's preferred cared for at home, there's normally has to be an unpaid carer in the background dealing with that. And I was wondering what support you are considered that might be needed for the carers um, if they are to be taking on extra like this and, and whether there's going to be more capacity for take, doing carers assessments. Um, and things like that. So um, in, engagement and participation with everybody that is affected by these changes is really, really important. And that, that can, that's being achieved in a number of different ways. So we've, we've obviously got carers engagement groups to make sure that the carers' voices are is 
that are up front and, and central to, to what we're delivering. We've also still con continuing to work with our locality empowerment groups in terms of the voice of the citizens who, who are in our communities and how they're affected. So as we go through these programmes, engagement and involvement will be absolutely critical um, to make sure that what, what we're planning meets the needs um, and the expectations and doesn't have any unintended consequences in, in our community, in, in particular with, with carers, as, as you've highlighted there, um, unintended consequences in relation to potential increased workload um, without supports being put in place could be very detrimental to the system. So we are seeking to take a whole systems approach to, to what we're doing and making sure that we are engaging with people as we go to, to minimise unintended consequences. Thank you. It's reassuring. OK, I don't see any other hands up, so. I think. We're noting the progress and we're going to note that further reports are going to be brought back to the IJB as and when. When can I just ask when RAP consider the performance indicators, can we make sure that that's recorded in detail in the minutes for RAP? So we'll see that at the appropriate IJB and if necessary, we could have a discussion then. So for everybody who's not attending risk and audit performance will understand how, you, how you've had your discussion about the development of the performance indicators here. Okay. Right, thank you, Gail. I'm just checking there's no. Right. Did I thought Shona, Shona had. Shona, yes, I see Shona's hand. Hi, it was just a quick question. It was in relation to kind of um, psychiatric care. Um, what about if the patient's actually not in a place when they can give consent to the carer giving information about them or they don't want that information given from the carer? What, what about those circumstances? Sorry, could you just elaborate a little bit more, please? Well, if a, if a patient is psychiatrically unwell, um, they, they might develop say, a psychosis where they think everybody's against them. So they may not want carer input. It doesn't mean that the carer input is not valid. It just means that, you know, they may have a problem with you accessing um, what the carer might have to say. And that could be perfectly valid, but it's just the permission, obviously, from the patient themselves. How is that going to impact? So, so in relation to those particular patients, we would seek advice um, in relation to our, our person-centred approach um, to make sure that we, we weren't doing anything that, that cut across any, any, any boundaries there. OK, thank you. OK. Right, we're now, we've now at the end of the public part of the meeting. So I think we can turn the recording off.